<laughs> My name is Evan, and I am a board member with the Psychedelic Society. I have been a board member for about two months, and it is a whole lot of fun. I won't go into the whole trying to get a <coughs> volunteer uh, again because I already, I already gave that speech. But once again, um, I was just sitting in the in the crowd like all of you four months ago and then I went to one meeting and someone stood up and said hey we need more people to volunteer who, who wants to help organize and I said sure yeah did not realize what I was getting myself <laughs> into at all but I'm really really glad that I that I did um, because this has been a lot of fun the psychedelic society um, is such a cool community of people here in Portland such amazing people uh, turned friends in the past in the past four months that I've been involved uh, and I really hope that you all get the chance to feel the same way about um, about this group of people that, that come to these events. Um, it really, really, really is a special time in history that we all get to gather and speak so freely about these medicines and share our experiences without fear, hopefully not too much fear. Uh, on that note, raise your hand if you are a police officer. <laughs> okay, cool. I trust you all. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, and on another note, no uh, soliciting substances or services within the Portland Psychedelic Society meetings until they're over. <laughs> and it's like, I didn't even hear anything. Okay? Not liable anymore. <laughs> All right, um, so yeah, a little about me and my experience growing mushrooms. Um, it's the entire reason I'm here in Portland. Last September, September 20th of 2018, I was living in a commune in Colorado, and I was growing mushrooms for this woman who was letting me crash there for free because I was giving all the other volunteers their mushrooms. Sweet deal. Uh, <laughs> and I was hitchhiking around. I'd left for, for a little bit to come up to Spokane with a friend, and we um, took a detour towards Portland because I saw that Paul Stamets was speaking. So he was here on September 20th, and I think he was here on September 21st of this year. I guess he just comes every year, which is but I met a man who was the photographer for the event, and his name was Matt, and struck up a conversation with him, what's his role in all this, and he told me that he was practicing as a psychedelic therapist in Portland, and I was just blown away. I was just like, whoa, we're that far along in this city, you know? One, that you know, someone is, is doing that, and two, to the point where they're just cool telling some random person they meet at a Paul Stamets event, you know? Like, is that the culture of Portland? I want in. That's awesome. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, talk to, talk to Matt for a while, and he mentioned to me that he was having trouble sourcing the medicine that he was giving to his patients. And so I told him, you should grow them because it's really not that hard. And if you have any questions, give me a call. I'm more than willing to help you out, and we can FaceTime, and... You know, I could, I could show you what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. Um, and he was really happy about that. Anyways, I go up to Spokane, I come back down to Colorado, I'm living there, and a couple months go by and it's December and Matt reaches out to me and says, hey, you should come to Portland and live in my house with me <laughs> and grow mushrooms for me. And I said, sure, that sounds awesome. <laughs> and uh, it was really strange, because he, he was, uh, I mean, he's got, he's got two kids, and uh, I remember I, I got to Portland that night, it was January 14th of this year, and I, I'm, I'm pulled over in front of Powell's, and I call him, and I'm like, hey, so I know I just met you that one night at Paul Stamets, but I really feel like we should, like, meet up again before I move into your house with your kids. <laughs> and he said, you know, the fact that you want to meet up means you're fine, dude. Just come on. <laughs> and then I was scared. I'm like, who is this guy? <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I, I, um, I lived with Matt um, until May and then moved over to the west side, which is when I started getting involved with the Psychedelic Society over here because people were getting frustrated that they couldn't make it to the southeast side at 6 p.m. on a weekday mm -hmm. and waste oh four hours in traffic. It's like, yeah. I, I don't want to do it that either. Um, so anyways, we have uh, the first meeting on the west side, the Portland Psychedelic Society, which is when I was describing um, 
the person that organized it wasn't even an organizer. She was just someone that was frustrated, and she was like, okay, so who wants to organize these from now on? And that's when I stood up. Um, so I've been in, in the west side of Portland since May and been organizing these events um, since May. And this is my fourth mushroom workshop. So I've made so many mistakes <laughs> the past three, and I'm probably going to make a bunch of mistakes this time. Hi there. But uh, bear with me. Um, like I said, I, 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 I've been growing mushrooms for the past two years. I'm not an expert, but I've had lots of success, and I've, I've had um, what I think is a decent amount of success and failures in order to be able to judge uh, what I think works. Um, but that was part of the things that I needed to switch from the past workshops because I've been teaching people the past three times my methods, what works for me, what I thought got the most mushrooms um, the quickest, which is something I was concerned with. But what I'm concerned for you all is that you can have a successful flush at all. You know, uh, it's very common for people to go to Fred Meyers, and buy all the equipment, and buy the spores, and you go home, and it's a lengthy process. Buying mushrooms from a drug dealer takes 30 seconds. Growing mushrooms at your house takes about two months, give or take, you know? So you have to be patient. Um, and to go through all of that, and to get to the mono tub at the very end, and you have this huge cake of mycelium, and then it gets contaminated is such a heartbreaking moment, and that's where a lot of people just drop off. So my goal, is to make sure that you all make it to the finish line and actually get mushrooms. So I've taken a lot of the um, extra stuff that I thought helped because as you'll do research online and as I'll kind of explain today, it's a very customizable experience. There's people on the online forums that will swear that if you don't put at least a fourth of coffee grounds in your substrate, that you are an idiot and you're doing it all wrong, you're not gonna get any mushrooms at all. And then there's people that will say the same thing about worm poop, and then the same thing about horse poop, and then gypsum, and blah, 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 the list goes on and on and on. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that they all grow mushrooms. A lot of it depends on, on you and your sterile techniques, a lot of it depends on your living situation in your house. Is it in a closet? Is it in a bathroom? Is it just sitting out in your living room? So much affects it. Is it June? or is it December? A lot factors into how much you're going to get, but as I said, my goal is to make sure that we all at least get some. Yeah, sweet. Mm -hmm. So who here has uh, mushroom growing experience, if you don't mind me asking? Beautiful, awesome. Okay, so uh, if you want to share you know, uh, your experience, um, feel free. If you want to correct me on something, please do, like I said. I want to make sure that everyone is getting um, the information that they deserve while they're here. So, all right, I've got a checklist that I'm just going to be working with here. Sweet. So, let's get started. Mushrooms are the reproductive structures of or mushrooms are the fruit of reproductive structures called fungi. So we say mushrooms all the time, and we think about these, right, in our heads, but actually it's just kind of like the tip of the iceberg. The organism is actually something known as mycelium, which is what we have here in these jars, and what you step on every day if you walk, you know, in the forest or... Um, yeah, anywhere in nature, it's, it's, it's underneath their feet at all times. So most mushrooms have a cap with gills. There are quite a few that don't, but you know, n normal mushrooms, this is what you'll think of, uh, uh, a mushroom with a cap and gills on its underside. And millions of microscopic units known as spores reside within the gills of the mushroom. And when mushrooms fruit in nature, the cap, the veil on the cap breaks, so the gills open up, and then the spores release, 
and are carried by wind into favorable environments in nature. And that can be cow poop, that could be you know, regular soil, that could be tree roots, that could be sand, it could be, it could be a lot of different things. Um, and when the spores land in this favorable environment, they form what are called hyphae. Um, they, look like, they look like veins or, or nerves and they travel through whatever substrate they've been introduced to, if it's a favorable substrate that they want to colonize. So the hyphae will grow and grow and grow until it forms an actual mycelium structure. And then the mycelium structure can last anywhere from um, weeks to decades. The largest organism on planet Earth is actually a colony of, my, of honey mushroom mycelium here in Oregon. I think it's something like, um, it's thousands of acres, really, this, this huge, huge, huge colony. And it goes dormant sometimes of the year, and then comes back to life, and then uh, when fruiting conditions permit, um, produces the mushrooms that restart the whole cycle and the colony grows and grows and grows and grows. So, nature is the best mushroom cultivator there is. You're never going to beat nature and it can be pretty frustrating to try to compare yourself to what's happening in, in nature because that's what we're doing here today is we're trying to take the microclimate that's happening, say, under a pine tree where a bunch of psilocybin mushrooms are growing, and we're trying to transfer that into this plastic tote container in our closet. And that's, that's, that's pretty, it's pretty difficult, but um, we're going to get the hang of it. So fungi do not photosynthesize or make their own food. Like us, they obtain nutrition from outside sources. The part that digests nutrients is the mycelium. So this is what we're feeding through this whole process. This is what we're protecting. This is what we're feeding. This is what we're trying to prolong and then eventually activate into the primordia that will turn into the mushrooms that we will eat. Wait, no we won't. That's not why we're here. Um, as I said, can survive for hundreds of years. Now there's three different types of mushrooms. There are parasitic mushrooms that feed on living organisms, usually trees. Uh, honey mushrooms are an example of a parasitic mushroom. Um, they are good and bad. You also might recognize um, lots of polyporous mushrooms, you know, like those conch mushrooms that you see on trees. They look so cool. They're actually usually not good for the trees. Um, then there's saprophytic mushrooms, and those are nature's recyclers. They replenish the soil by breaking down organic matter, and they are extremely vital to the environment, and that's what we're, what we're dealing with here. Uh, almost every psilocybin mushroom is a saprophytic mushroom. And then there's also the mycorrhizal mushrooms that mutually benefit um, the plants that they are connected to. Um, they exchange nutrients, the mycelium forms these shields around the roots that can help bring nutrients in not only to the mycelium itself, but to the plant structure, whether it be a tree or a, you know, ivy or whatever it is. Um, and that's another important thing to remember about mycorrhizal mushrooms when you are hunting, you know, to associate which trees have a relationship with which mushrooms. And so if you could start to remember, you know, the mushrooms that are associated with Douglas firs or alders or redwoods, you're gonna have a much easier time hunting for mushrooms in the wild. Nice. Yeah. So today we are going to learn about the monotub technique. Now there are, I don't know how many techniques, but a whole lot. The two that I've taught here at PPS was the PF technique, which is easy for beginners, but in my opinion, is kind of a waste because it takes just as much time for a lot less mushrooms. The PF tech, you might have seen it. Um, 
fruits in a chamber like this, but the bottom is filled with perlite, and then there are little cakes that sit on top, and then the mushrooms just grow from the cake. Now, it's a really easy technique, and I highly recommend it to beginners, uh, just to kind of get the hang of it, but at the same time, you could get the hang of this just as easily, and the difference is ounces and ounces of mushrooms at the end. So. Let's get started with what you're gonna need to, to grow these mushrooms. So this is a list of supplies. I've got, I've got everything as far as I'm concerned. Um, two big tubs. Um, the second tub isn't entirely necessary. Uh, it's this, which is our still air box. And what this is for is for providing a sterile technique as we um, interact with some of the more fragile parts of the, of the process. When we expose spores, when we expose mycelium, when we transfer myceliated grain so that we can multiply our jars, we put these gloves on and we operate inside this box so that bacteria isn't floating around like it is in this room right now. You know, we can't see it, but there's, you know, wind currents everywhere in this room and bacteria is landing on us and then taking back off. And so that's happening in your house, it's happening everywhere. This, you know, creates a little micro environment so that you don't risk, you know, contamination with, with anything. But like I said, if you trust your bathroom or your closet, you know, and you've bleached it down. This isn't entirely necessary, but back to my point about you all being beginners and about there being a higher risk, it's not that much work to increase the chances of you getting that fruit, to increase the chances of you having this hobby as a future, or having, yeah, a future with this hobby. So, two big tubs, micropore tape, it's extremely important that it's it's micropore tape or, um, yeah, or transport tape. Uh, basically, the tape needs to be breathable. So, medical tape also works. You know, for for wounds and stuff like that that allow allow air to get through, um, and that's important because it's going to be the filter for air exchange in our boxes, jars. For this technique, it doesn't matter whether or not it's wide mouth or um, narrow or how big it is. It just has to be uh, glass that can be um, pressure cooked. You can also use bags. That's a really common technique. I don't agree with it because you're wasting more plastic. You know, these are entirely reusable. You can um, clean them and disinfect them and sterilize them over and over and over again in bags. You order once, you colonize them, and then you just have to cut it up and throw it away. Gloves, just for sterile technique, cocoa core. And I would just like to mention a good, a good source. Um, I always go to Naomi's Farm Supply. Some of you might be familiar, it's on uh, Powell on 26. I don't know what the cross street is, but it's kind of by uh, De Nicolas, and they have really good prices um, on a lot of farm supply needs. You can also get your vermiculite there, which is another important thing. Uh, and also a note about your vermiculite, when you're buying it, make sure it's coarse grade. That means it's not like powder, you know, it's like little, little balls. And then you also want to get spores. And that brings us over here, um, where we're gonna source our spores. This is a list of websites that I recommend using. Something I'm kind of disappointed about today. I ordered 35 syringes to uh, be able to give, to away, give away today off of Reddit, and something was messed up with their shipping. Um, I'm not entirely sure if it was the person that I bought them from, but I've been tracking it the whole week. I paid for two day shipping, but it's been six days. And it said today that it was finally in transit to my house. 
and then I had to come here. <laughs> so I haven't checked it since. It's probably there now. But um, yeah, just just know also that if you if you need spores um, and you don't want to go through online, I have a bunch now. So um, get in touch with me after this, and uh, we can figure out some way for me to deliver to deliver them to you. Because spores are entirely legal. You don't have to worry about getting in trouble for ordering them online. They're technically for microscopy use, which is what we're going to be using them for. <laughs> and so, yeah, but I mean, if you, if you would rather order them online, um, just to be safe, I mean, using a VPN isn't a bad idea, but I personally don't think it's necessary. So there's SporeWorks, there's mushrooms.com, and there's littleshopofspores.com. And then if you're familiar with Reddit, there is a subreddit called Spore Traders that is usually extremely reliable, and um, there's really good people on there. And then I also have this subreddit, uh, rshrooms. It's full of people that are growing, and there's tons of pictures of their progress. Um, I've been a member of that sub uh, community on Reddit for, for a while, and I want the, the people that attend meetings like this to be able to share progress with each other, but there's not a very secure way for any of us to do that right now. So I think an anonymous account on Reddit is, is probably the easiest way. I mean, you won't know whether or not you're really interacting with one of us, but there's hundreds of people, so it's even better. So, as I said, the spores, they drop from the cap and are carried by the wind to a good place. Now, we are going to be replacing that good place in nature with this box and the substrate. Covered ordering. Also, when you're ordering, Golden Teachers, B+, plus, Z Strains, um, Albino, Penis NB, or just regular Penis NB. All really good strains for beginners, species for beginners. They are um, naturally resistant to contamination. They're, they're more resilient than other strains that um, aren't, aren't used to the environment that we're gonna be creating today. These are just generally known as, across the board as, as strong strains that I always recommend for beginners. Any questions so far? Sure. Are those larger, though, the small ones, the golden teachers? Are those, do those get real big or do those taste pretty small? Depends all on how, how you can accomplish this. They, they can be huge, they can be the size of your forearm, or they can be the size of a dime. Yeah, there's different stages of them. It depends on also on, on how much substrate you use. Um, some of my monotubs are about half this size. And I know people that have monotubs that are double this size. And so, you know, it depends a lot on, on how much substrate you are packing into this box and how much nutrients the mycelium can feed off of so that when you introduce it to fruiting conditions, it has so much more momentum behind it to create these gigantic mushrooms as compared to, you know, a little tiny box with only, you know, say maybe a pound or so of substrate so yeah, I mean, it really, it really depends. It's, but there totally are, I mean, certain characteristics. That, for instance, Golden Teachers do look more like that. Albino Penis Envy, they look more like that, which, you know, kind of <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, we're gonna talk about sterilizing your jars. Um, and like I said, uh, I wanna thank John. Uh, for bringing this bag. He brought a bag of uh, rye grain. I'm not sure exactly how we would divvy that up, but he brought well, a, a bunch bag of uh, bags too. Right, but you're gonna, I mean, I, I would also recommend you just go buy a bag. It's 25 bucks. Bob's Red Mill, like the mill, is in Milwaukee, Oregon. I don't know if there's people here that don't know that, but that's pretty cool. I mean, that's an awesome company. Um, and you go there, and there's uh, you know, cashier is right by the door. You have to tell them you want a giant bag of rye grain. 
and then they will go into the back of the store and they'll bring it out for you. But 25 bucks for this much rye grain is a steal, and I highly recommend you go it's there. Under 20? What's uh, that? Under 20. Uh, with a with a coupon. Well, uh, uh, actually, actually, it's almost 30, but I have Chinook Boca, so it's 10 dollars off. So get the uh, Chinook Book just, too. Just under 20. Oh, Great gotcha. book. Yeah. Sweet. Thanks again, John. Uh, yeah, and that's that's what I use. My bag's right there with all my grain. And so, um, any mason jar will work. Um, previously, I mentioned PF Tech method has to be wide mouth because you take the grain and you pop it um, into the fruiting chamber. But for the mono tub, it doesn't matter. You're going to take this, and it doesn't matter how loose it is. You're just going to mix it in, so it can have a narrow mouth to the jar. Okay, um, I generally like to use larger jars just because um, bigger is better. Yeah, bigger is better. You know, it's easier to clean them. And it is easier. Yeah. So you are going to take your pressure cooker. This one. Um, Can we talk about preparing the rye. Oh yeah. Um, so you take your rye, get a big bowl, dump um, however much you want to fill up. Um, you know, I usually do four or five jars at a time, so I fill up like a, like a decent sized kitchen bowl, I forgot to bring it, but I fill that up with the rye grain and then I pour water in there so that it's just above the rye grain and I let that sit on my kitchen counter overnight. You want to soak that so that, you know, the, the berries are hydrated. Does it need to be sterile at that point? No, nope, it doesn't no. need to be sterile. Okay. Nothing, not, you don't have to wear gloves or spray Lysol or any of that shit because it's about to go into the pressure cooker, and then from there on it'll be ready to go. Yeah. So you barely cover the rye grains and the water. You cover it like half, half inch of water. And the water is completely absorbed. So. Uh, yeah, the water will be completely absorbed by the next morning, and then you want to make sure you use it immediately because if you let that sit, the berries are going to start to sprout, and then you're going to have, you know... Right. Sprouted berries are really good. Yeah. Like, it's not what we're going for here. Like that. <laughs> Use the leftover berries and make some sprouted whatever. Don't so, add water, just dry uh, wet berries is what you got. Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and then you want to take a spoon and get those. You don't want to dump into jars or anything because you don't want like actual liquid like in the jars. You know, you just want the berries. So, um, after that happens. Um, for my, uh, I, I boiled mine after I soaked them the next day. I boiled them for maybe oh. about 10 minutes, and then I dumped off that excess water, and then the steam kind of cleared the moisture off the surface of the rye for me, so it was like, maybe mine was on a little of the dry side, but it's, it's doing well, so, you know. Yep. Thanks, Jason. Yeah. So you use cooked berries, and you use uncooked berries. You're, you're putting them in the, in the uh, pressure cooker in the mason jars, right? Yes. Okay. So, you got this jar. It's full of berries. It could be more full than this. Uh, it, can, it can go up to the mouth. And then you want to take a piece of tin foil and cover it. You don't want the cap on for this stage because um, no uh, moisture is going to be able to get through to help sterilize because these are airtight, you know, so it's not going to work. So, I usually put them back on like this. You don't have to put them all the way, but just like that. And there's tin foil, and then uh, the steam will go up under and then sterilize the berries. Um, so we're sterilizing now, and then we'll be pasteurizing the sub substrate later. So this is an important distinction to make, is that we are killing almost all of the bacteria when we sterilize with the pressure cooker. And when we pasteurize the substrate, where it's, it's lower heat, for longer time so that some of the bacteria is still alive because it's it's good for the mushrooms they enjoy the nutrients and all that so five or six of these maybe just one wouldn't make sense to do just one though if you're if you're cooking them at one night you know you might as well do six take them you're also going to want um, we generally use the rings layer them on the bottom you could also use like a cake pan or something but you just don't want the jars to touch the bottom because they'll crack and explode. Um, similar to what we'll be using with the pillowcase because it'll burn to the bottom of the pan. Sweet. So you'll stack those up. The foil's not punctured or perforated, right? Nope. Okay. Yep, just covered and then uh, put in place on there. Stack those up there. 
wherever you see fit. Oh, and you want to fill it with water, and you'll want the water to just come up right above the lid. Oh. That wasn't your foot. No, I'm good. No, I'm good. Right above the lip. So you want the water to just come up right there. So maybe a half, half inch oh, okay. above the jar. That's how much water should be in your pressure cooker. Is there a reason for that that you know of? Yeah, so that the there's the steam. steam. Enough water? I mean, get enough okay. water for steam. Make sure you have enough. Yeah. Yeah, that's I mean that's that's vital too. If you try if you try sterilizing with no water in there, you are going to make it explode. But the, the, the mistake would be in putting uh, not it would not be a mistake in putting too much water in as much. So no. it's pretty it's no. okay. Well, I mean it's gonna be boiling in there too, you know, how much of that. I don't know. You just don't want yeah, I mean half inch. I won't go into it more. Just <laughs> put a half inch of water in there. Half inch above. Yeah. The water soaked the lid. So Yeah, um, you know, as long as you can get it to... Canning's the same process. Yeah, it's pretty similar. You know, you just want it to steam and get so hot. I mean, some people just use a, you know, a pot with a, the lid. You can get it to around 200 degrees and let it sit there for an hour. You're, you're probably fine. You know? But pressure cookers, I like because it instills confidence. And pot's done. So... It doesn't have to be on, whatever. So um, <laughs> pop it on, make sure you pull it closed. And then um, there's usually a little rocker that's on here. Um, Maybe on the floor somewhere. I'm sure you all have experience with pressure cookers. Um, so you want to make sure it gets to 15 PSI. That's the sweet spot, 15 PSI. You should have a little gauge on your pressure cooker. If you don't, you can get them on Amazon, hook them up. Um, and then you want it to sit there at 15 PSI for one hour. And then after that hour's up, it'll start steaming. And then you want to turn the stove off and then take it off and then <coughs> go to bed. Oh. <laughs> do you do the, uh, the natural um, release method where it t comes in naturally? Or do you put the, you know, do the quick release with the cold water on the pressure cooker? No, I let it, I let it naturally let it cool naturally. off. Okay. That's why I said, go to bed, you know, do this at night, and then in the morning you wake up and you have sterilized jars. Gotcha. Um, you know, obviously turn off the stove. So obviously you're cooking the rye berries too, just like he cooks the rye berries. Except you're, he cooks you're not cooking them, you're sterilizing them. Well, I don't know they, that they my get, process they get hot. Is they get extremely <laughs> hot, yes. Have you ever heard of anybody using an Instapot with these? Because you can't really I see. have tried. Oh, in the water. So and they work, the berries, but yes, you have to do it for much, much longer. And I've had a lot of experience with contamination uh, when I had to use an Instapot or, you know, like rice cooker type thing. And I probably chalk it up to the fact that the rice cooker or the Instapot doesn't get hot enough. It just doesn't reach 15 PSI. Okay. Is there generally a heat setting, like low, medium, or high that you keep it at to maintain that 15? Or is um, specific to, I mean, I know there's a lot of variations. Yeah, totally. Lots of variations. Um, yeah. Just experiment with your own stove. Yeah, Mine's yeah, usually on medium. Like, yeah. Okay. yeah. Mine's on, like, the dead lowest once I get to 15. Oh, right. Well, when it gets to 15, yeah, just, yeah, okay. just set yeah, it so that it can same. remain stable okay. and it doesn't keep increasing. Uh, I have had luck with an Instant Pot, but you can't. You have to use the um, the quart jars instead of the, the yeah. pint jars. It's usually so the case, too. They're pretty small. They're pretty, yeah, pretty short. You can get bigger jars than those. Sweet. So, it's the next morning, we wake up, it's like Christmas. We take it off, and we have our sterilized jars. Now, um, I don't think I, I brought them, no. But, pretend I'm putting on gloves. <laughs> and I've recently showered, my hair's back with the scrunchie, and I, I'm being very cautious of everything that I'm, that I'm doing now. It's, I've, I've cleaned the kitchen counter, with my, um, you know, cleaner liquid or whatever. And um, like I said, practicing caution, because now we have sterilized jars that are ready to go. But you have to realize that in the environment, is, there's, there's just bacteria in this room right now. There's so much bacteria that's just floating around in the air. Um, and so you just have to be cautious of that. Gloves, and they will install them in their still air box. So they're completely, 
uh, encompassed in there. Um, it's not necessary. As you can imagine, there's not that much air getting to this box anyways. But I think that if you have the time, I think that's a good idea. You know, just like with some Gorilla Glue or something, just sealing it around the holes. Some people online are saying that that creates like a, a vacuum too, so it would suck more stuff into the little cracks mm -hmm. if you have them kind of glued in there. Mm -hmm. Every time you put your hands in, it just sucks all that air in. But I don't know if that's something you have experience with actually having attached at all. Or you're saying that when you when you reach your hand in, you're pushing air into the gloves. Well, when you're yeah, because like the gloves come out, they're inside out. So when you pull them out, basically you're sucking the air and through mm -hmm. those little cracks on the top. But yeah, that's a good point. Um, but then another thing. Um, either way, but. Yeah, you're also going to want you know to have hand sanitizer in there. And so every time you use those gloves, just like wash them. You know, um, cool. be careful with that. And so then what we'll do for this part. So we've got our syringe here. I have a question. Yeah. How much time in the pressure cooker once the exhaust starts? For 20, okay. 20 minutes. minutes. Okay. Yeah. When it starts steaming, 20 minutes. Um, let it steam for 20 and then shut everything off. Let it cool until you wake up in the morning. Or I mean, obviously you can do it throughout the day. I just think it's most convenient to set it up before you go to bed. So. We have our spore syringe that is full of, let's just say, golden teachers, and we have our sterilized jars here. So what we're going to do next is we are going to flame sterilize the needle, just for extra precaution. So what that looks like is we're going to take this and be careful of the flame inside this thing. You don't want to burn the, the lid. Yeah. Oh, another reason not to use Lysol? It'll cause an explosion. Like That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, it happens. Yeah, totally. And also, I mean, make sure there's no pools of alcohol anywhere in your yeah. your box. So I'm just gonna, you know, do this for about five seconds, and then you're gonna let it cool off. I usually have a, a little alcohol pad in here with me, and then I'll just wipe the needle, and even more sterilization. And then what you'll do is you'll take the spores, and when you get a spore syringe, you'll see the spores in the water. It looks like um, kind of like a milky cloud, and you'll just want to shake it up so that it spreads out and separates inside the syringe. And then what you're going to do, and I'm going to show this outside of the box, um, just because it'll be easier to show everyone. Just imagine I'm doing this inside here. Yeah. What you're going to do is you're going to take it, and you're going to go through the injection port or through the polyfill or just regular Tyvek tape, whatever worked out for you. They're all very effective. And you are going to make sure that you go four times, once on each side, and you want to make sure that the needle hits the side of the glass. And this is so that you can monitor the mycelium as it grows, uh, as compared to if you were just sticking it inside the grain and, and injecting it. You know, you wouldn't know if there was anything going on for weeks. Whereas if you do this, you'll know in a couple days whether or not the mycelium or the hyphae are forming correctly and uh, in a healthy manner. So you'll do that. Um, I use half a cc per side. So two cc's per jar. You can use less. You can use one, you can use half a cc per jar. Or you can use five cc's per jar. This used in the little jars, how much you'd use? Like a half a cc for the whole jar, like just a little bit? Uh, the little jars, like the pint jars, yeah. it's just half the size of this, so I would just use a cc. The cc. So maybe a quarter, okay. or you could you could just do half cc per two sides, you know, and then have two sides where nothing was going on. Um, or like I said, you could literally just do one side. Just be aware that that is all going to affect how long it takes to colonize the jar. So say I were to squirt this whole syringe in this jar, I was going to go two cc's, two cc's, two cc's, two cc's. This will probably be colonized in a week, which is which is like extremely fast. Now, if we did what I recommended and did um, two cc's for the whole jar, it'd be more like two to three weeks to colonize it. But that that's just, and that's that's an, another nice thing about having an infinite amount of spore syringes after you have your first harvest is that it doesn't matter. You know, you can inject a whole syringe into a jar and not feel bad. 
Um, but you are going to feel bad if you're paying 10 bucks for every single one, and then one of these gets contaminated, that's a huge waste. So um, be conservative when you're buying them as you're getting started. That's a stupid question, but no when you say <laughs> um, four times per jar, you just have the one spot that the needle goes in, or are you saying to have more than one place that the needle can go into the jar through the No, lab? it's just going to be through one port, okay. but you're just going to have to angle it. Got it. Yeah. yeah. And also, um, y'all should get a bigger box. This is <laughs> <laughs> This is the worst. <laughs> I made this today. I thought it worked when I was home. I'm like, yeah, this is fine. Um, but no, you should you should probably use the 56 quart when you're when you're making this at home. And you could probably also loosen the lid a little bit and then stick it in, right, to, to get different angles if you can't get to the side of it. Yeah, you can do that as well. Yeah. yeah, just just know that you're 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 risking, you know, you're getting risky if you are opening it up like that. But when we get to grain to grain transfers, and I talk about that, that's essentially what you're doing anyways. Grain to grain transfer, and this is a perfect example because I got one in here that's you know already pretty colonized. So this has mycelium in it. You know, it's, you know maybe you can't see it, but it's it's white in a lot of areas. Um, so grain to grain transfer is when I take this jar and I open it up. And I pop it and I take um, it's usually a quarter a jar per other grain jars a really effective way to multiply what you have um, yeah it's easy and it's effective um, but you just take other sterilized jars and you would only fill them with um, maybe three-fourths the amount of rye grain that I have in there and then you would take a fourth of this pop it in there shake it up and then um, that one's good to go. Use another fourth, shake it up. So that's another way to conserve um, what you've got. And if you have a healthy jar full of mycelium, I, I recommend that you, you take that step. But just know that it's, it's a risk because, like you said, Micah, you, we're, we're opening it up yeah. and exposing it. But that's what the still air box is for. Uh, is there an upper limit on how much you can transfer? Because I noticed on my first strain, like after pretty long while like the immunity would go down and I'd have to and I'd like ditch the whole stream because I did so many transfers yeah so you're essentially you're taking out like half the life cycle mm -hmm. you're gonna you're gonna put some strain on it for sure yeah. um so yeah can you explain again so you did like, is there a limit times? like an upper limit of like how much how many times you can transfer yes okay so for instance I think what, what you're referring to is so say I took this jar and I transferred it to this jar now this is colonized but this is a second generation of our golden teachers that we inoculated into the first jar. So then we take this jar and we inoculate four more jars. They're those are doomed. <laughs> those are just, <laughs> those are really stressed out. They're like, what the hell? I just want to be a mushroom. What is this guy doing to me? Just let me fruit, come on. So they, um, yeah, they, they will get a lot weaker uh, as you do that. So just know that when you get to the third generation, you're pushing it. It's not impossible, but you're you're pushing it. I've gotten to like ten or twelve. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, uh, yeah then that, that's another thing is that with something like Golden Teacher, you know, fourth or fifth generation, you're probably still fine. Ten or twelve, was it Golden Teacher? B, B plus. B plus. Yeah. So yeah, thanks for thanks for bringing that up. That's an important thing to consider when you're doing the green to green transfers, and that's also why I popped a. Oh, I didn't. I chose to not put the sharpie in here. Um, I take that back. So, as you can see, I have labels on all the jars. This is B plus from November twentieth. So that's really important too. Um, and then I don't. I haven't done any grain to grain transfers. But if I were to, uh, the next set of jars, I'd put G two, second generation, and then G three as I go on. And if you make it G ten. <laughs> so, question about yes. the previous step. Um, with the spore syringe, when you are putting it in the pressure cooker, you're putting it in there with the spores in it, or no? Or just sterilizing just your syringe? 
just sterilizing the syringe. Empty okay. syringes that I've already used so okay. that I can feel more confident about reusing them again that and is, making more spores. That is if you're choosing to make your own spores. That's correct. Yeah, if you are only buying them because um, you're a baller, then, <laughs> you know. Um, I am. So, you know. <laughs> Don't even worry about it. <laughs> okay, it's in, uh, was it? Okay, so Thank yeah. You. And then when you have your spore syringe, you're just wiping it down with alcohol and sanitizing it that way in the flame. Yep, that's correct. And making sure that you shake it so that it gets circulated throughout the entire syringe because what can happen a lot is that you got this thick clump of mycelium that's chilling inside the, or not mycelium, it's not mycelium yet, thick clump of spores inside the sterilized water and you're putting two cc's, two cc's, er, half a cc, half a cc, half a cc, and you haven't even got a single spore because it's all waiting towards the back of the syringe, and then it all just comes out in one blob. Anyways, um, yeah, so shaking is important too. Any more questions about inoculation? Cool. <coughs> so I'll put that there. Take all my stuff. Out. So, after we inoculate, yeah. we are going to take our jars and we are going to designate a space in our house that these jars can live for the next, as I said, two to three weeks if you use two cc's per jar. So, this is going to be a warm and dark place, still air is important. Don't put these in a closet in the main hallway of your house where people are gonna be walking past and air is gonna be kicked up underneath the doors and there's going to be flowing air inside of there. Uh, the room that you use least in your house is a good idea. Um, also, I usually prefer second floors as it's warmer up there. You want these to be at around 70 to 75 degrees while they're colonizing. They can be less. Like I said, they're, they're in the sterilized grain. The mycelium's hungry. They want to, you know, um, stretch and grow and colonize, um, but there's gonna be a lot of factors and temperature is definitely one of them. Say your house is at a, you know, toasty 68 all the time. It's just gonna take longer, probably, you know, upwards of four to five weeks. Say your house is colder, they probably just won't grow. But that doesn't mean you can't turn up the heat and then kick it. Yeah. So what's the upper limit of heat? If you put it on a very low, low um, warming pad, mm -hmm. what's the upper limit that you don't want to exceed? 80 degrees. 80. At that point, yeah, 80 degrees and up, you are encouraging other bacteria to join in on the grain party we have going on in our jars. Have you ever used uh, plant heating pads? Yeah, so then that's what, that's what she just mentioned. Um, so the heating pads, I've had success, but if you use them, you wanna make sure that you are putting them, like that, that they're not touching the jars. So when I put my jars, cause I, I, I colonized um, mine in a closet upstairs. Um, this is theoretical. Um, in a box like this. So, and, and, and I've experimented with putting the heating pad down and then putting all the jars on top of them. And what happened was, I'll show you all, uh, this. It melted the mycelium, it melted the grain because it's just too hot on one side. So you're just, you're cooking, you know, the mycelium and all the moisture that's inside it. I mean, it's just disgusting. <laughs> so, um, if you're going to use the heating pad, which is a good option because the contrary to that is a space heater, which can get expensive, you know, uh, for your electric bill. So uh, the heating pad is a good idea, but like I said, just make sure it's not directly touching anything and that it's just creating this, you know, microclimate inside there that can kind of encompass the jars without, without directly touching them. Any more questions about colonization? Is the space a dry space or humid? Um, I don't think it really matters that much. No, I've never I've never paid much attention to humidity, um, or seen it brought up in forums or books. So, 
Do you keep the lid on it in the closet when the jars are in it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you want to just you want to prevent as much air directed towards those jars as humanly possible. So, uh, and then another thing is that you know you're going to be so excited because this is so much fun, and you're going to want to check them all the time. But I recommend you only check them once a day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's back to the moving air. Yeah. <laughs> you could. Uh, so, so this is the thing. You could leave it for four weeks and then come back, and most definitely there's going to be fully colonized jars. If you are that self-disciplined, you, you, you could do that. But the issue with that is, is that what we're checking them daily for is contamination. And this is like the bane of our existence is contamination. And at this point, I'll toss around these jars. So this is healthy B plus's sibling, except it was contaminated with one of the most common contaminations. I'm going to make a little list here. Trichodermia otherwise known as trike. It is blue slash green um, and fuzzy and gross <laughs> sad. <laughs> so, I have these labeled here and I have circled the trike um, in red in all these little spots. Now if you look below it's really healthy mycelium. Um, and then I also want to point out that there's some yellow spots. You'll get this yellow liquid in your jars, and all that is is the moisture hitting the mycelium and then being pressed up against the, the glass, and then it's just kind of uh, like uh, disintegrating. But it's not, it's not a huge issue. I have one jar that's health, uh, healthy and, and it has the yellow liquid in it. Uh, otherwise called mycelium piss. I think it's like metabolite. It's like a defense mechanism. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'll take that and you can pass that around. Um, this is another one that's contaminated. I don't have to circle where it's contaminated, not this one. You can just observe. Um, but that's trike. Trike. And so if it's contaminated, you have to throw everything away. So let's let's go through this scenario. You know, you're going up to your jars and you are checking them out and you're like oh my babies how are you doing no! and you see that there's a trike at one of the jars and um, what you're going to do is you're going to immediately separate that and then you're going to check on the rest of your babies and if there's no more trike match it up take this <laughs> right out the window. <laughs> um, no, but seriously, you want to get it out of your house. You want to get it away from all your healthy jars uh, as quickly as possible because the longer it's sitting there, the more chance it has to travel through your Tyvek and infect the rest of your jars, which is why you want to check it daily or semi-daily. I mean, at least a few times a week, you know, because <clears throat> feel free to wait four weeks when your sterile technique is is you know down the pat and you're confident in the fact that you could toss a bunch of jars in the closet and walk away and know that you are extremely sterile and they're going to colonize just fine you know if that's if that's what you're capable of power to you i'm impressed you're awesome but it's not going to be the case where we're all starting soon and do we want to reuse the jar like wash it and use it again or really yeah you can stare you can you can sterilize it and it'll be yeah, it'll be good as new. Uh, and another thing that people sometimes uh, like to do, this is more possible in the summer, it's not gonna work right now, but I've heard of, uh, and, and known one person that takes that contaminated jar and goes outside, sprinkles it in the yard, and then actually gets healthy mycelium that grows around the yard, and then has gotten a couple, a couple of mushrooms in the garden, which is pretty sweet, you know? So. Uh, any other questions about uh, colonization? Checking it, where it should be, the temperature, we're all good? Yeah. So, about four weeks into this, okay? So, say you go home next week and you get started. It's now, 
you know, the second week of January. And now you have jars that are uh, colonized. Now this one is not fully colonized. It will be like perfectly white. It just, it was unfortunate that it, timing didn't line up that I, I had, you know, a fully colonized jar uh, to bring with me, but it'll be, uh, yeah, purely white, kind of like, no, I'm not even gonna mention that at all. <laughs> Um, you'll know, you know, it, it'll, it'll be all fluffy and perfect and beautiful and there won't be any blue spots and uh, very little yellow spots and it'll be sweet. And so what you'll do is you will um, go to the place in your home that you're colonizing these and you will take, actually before you even touch them, what you want to do, you want to leave them in their, in their pretty spot. And you want to make the monotub before you do anything. Just like how you should leave the pressure cooker before you're ready. Don't, don't even touch your colonized jars till you're ready to take those jars and put them in this. So, so we're, I'm going to explain how to fully prepare the monotub, otherwise known as the fruiting chamber. In the PF tech, that's what this next step is called because you take the jars and in the PF tech, you use the jars that have wide mouths because you literally just, and the whole cake pops out and like I mentioned before, you stick it on perlite that helps maintain um, water uh, your humidity inside the fruiting chamber and then all the mushrooms fruit off of a little tiny thing. You've probably seen it uh, tons of times. Um, but in this case, we are going to put more substrate in the actual chamber and then colonize that again. So there's a second colonization period, a whole nother <laughs> chance and opportunity to fuck things up with contamination um, so this is where it gets it gets real and then it'll double as our fruiting chamber from there so this is all we got to worry about uh, from here on out but it's a lot of work so 56 quart container is what I have right here it can be smaller it can be bigger depends on how many mushrooms you want so um, I didn't have a spare monotub that wasn't in use, so um, I went and bought this one yesterday, but I didn't have time to drill with my uh, hole saw into the, into the sides. This is an important tip that I forgot to mention though, um, and it'll explain how I made these holes. I took an empty coffee can and I popped it on my stove for 10-15 seconds and it got real hot and I pressed it against the plastic and it just... Really effective. A lot of the times when you'll be using a saw or some type of knife, you're gonna crack the whole damn box and yeah. then you have these leaks and it's not a whole lot of fun. So I recommend if you're gonna use a saw or something, take a block of wood and put it behind it so that it kind of helps relieve the pressure. But coffee can, uh, obviously these ones are much smaller than these. So you're gonna have to use a different type of, of can. Um, but that's just another option to explore. <coughs> also hole saws, they work great. So, um, I just drew black circles with an expo marker. So just follow with me here. Mm -hmm. We have these holes in this big tub, okay? What we're going to do next is we are going to take um, our micropore tape, our breathable tape, and we're going to tape over the holes so that we're getting air in there, not a ton of air, and not a whole lot of bacteria either. How big should those holes be? <clears throat> Um, I guess about I two inches on that one. Yeah, about two inches. Two inches in diameter. Where do you get the micropore tape? Rite Aid. Okay. Rite Aid, Fred Meyers, they'll have it everywhere. Um, it'll say on the packaging whether or not it's breathable. Okay. Um, but if you can, the, the best tape is autoclave tape. Mm -hmm. and it's not expensive, it's just not commonly in stores. So that'll be in your... Amazon shopping cart when you go home tonight. It's just called autoclave? Autoclave tape. Yep. And it's a, yeah, it's just, it's, it's a, a really good um, size and material so that it's not only breathable, but the best at trapping out contaminants. This um, <coughs> is a little less effective, but cheaper and at right aid. So. So, we got our holes, they're taped up. The next thing we're going to do is we are going to tape a liner 
to the side of the box. So you're going to want to use a dark trash bag. This one isn't as dark as I would like it. Um, it's a weird, weird material trash bag. Um, I usually use ones that are thicker, um, so you can, they're not translucent like this. Because what you're doing is, you are preventing your substrate from getting hit by any light so that it doesn't start pinning at the bottom of the box or on the sides of the box. Um, because light will eventually activate the fruiting, um, uh, the fruiting session or the fruiting step. And uh, you don't want um, yeah, the light to hit, to hit it on the sides because then you're going to have pins that can't actually grow anywhere. But you have to think about the mushrooms and the substrate block like an energy bar. Okay, um, not one that you eat, but like for instance, like like a health bar, you know. And so it has it has so much momentum based on the nutrients that you've given it, how long it's been able to colonize, you know. It's 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 up here and it's full. Uh, and say we don't use the black liner and we just let them pin randomly all over the damn place. What do you mean by pin? So Free. pinning pinning is this. Pinning is when the mycelium starts to form these little tiny oh. things. These little baby mushrooms are called pins. They're called aborts. The you know uh, official name is primordia. But um, yeah, like for instance, uh, I work at a mushroom cultivation farm part time, and we grow uh, culinary mushrooms like lion's mane and oyster mushrooms and chestnuts, and so we use bags um, because jars would take too much time, which sucks because we waste a lot of plastic. But we have this bag, it's this block of mycelium, right, that's wrapped in plastic. It's been colonizing for 12 days or something, and it's, it's all white, and it's, it's wrapped up um, in, this, in this section of the warehouse. And to fruit it, we bring it into a chamber, we introduce it to fresh air, light, and um, higher humidity and water. And for every pound, you are going to get um, a tenth of that back in mushrooms. That's kind of the standard ratio. So we have 10 pound bricks. So we cut the bag and peel back the plastic. And now we've exposed this side of it to air. So now there's all tons of mushrooms that start fruiting on that side. And it's crazy, but you can see the mycelium Kind of move and like gather, you know, all of their all of their resources to fruit, because you know you got to think about it like that. This creature is trying to survive, so it's using everything it's got to get out to drop the spores, so that it can keep growing and, and colonizing things. So that's happening here, and that's that's just. I mean, it's a really long explanation for the trash bag. That's why we are trying to you know, uh, direct everything towards the top because that's where we're going to be harvesting it from. Not the sides, not the bottom, and also that's a waste. The more you get on the sides, the less you're going to get on the top and the less you're going to be able to use. So, erase that. Does that, does that make sense about the, the energy that they have in, in the bricks? Okay, sweet. So, you've got this trash bag in here now. Um, and this is going to be a pain to, to tape it up, so bear with me. But you're going to want to make sure that the trash bag is taped about two to three inches above, above that. That's how high our strub substrate is going to end up being, is two to, three, two to three inches. So I'm just taking, taking my tape, taping the bag. I had a question when taping. Yes. Um, I wasn't sure what the. If maybe if not. Never mind. I don't think you've gotten to it yet. I'll come back to it if it's okay. it not a good question. Thank you. Can you tape the bag on the outside? Can what? Can you tape the bag on the outside of the tub? So you can, but um, when I get to what's called flushing, it's going to make sense why you want the okay. trash bag on the inside. Um, basically what a flush is, is after we have this brick of myceliated substrate um, and then we harvest all the mushrooms off of it, we are going to have the opportunity 
to pick that brick out of it, and it's going to be like a giant Rice Krispie treat. And then we are going to dunk that either in another tub, or I just use the bathtub, and then put it back, and then we're going to get a whole nother flush of mushrooms. That can happen like upwards of 10 times. And it's kind of like the whole generation thing where, you know, towards seven or eight, you're gonna get like, like it's not gonna be nearly as what you had in the first or second or third, but it's possible. And I've gotten as much as half a pound dried off of one brick after seven or eight flushes. So it's it's pretty ridiculous. Yes. So is also the purpose then to, to use the plastic to carry the brick? Yeah. So yeah, so what I'm saying is yeah, it's it's helpful that it's on the inside because, you know, once you've harvested everything, you can just kind of like tug at the bags and it'll just kind of break it from the plastic and it'll be loose and it's just I just find it's easier like that. So I'll finish taping this up. Any other questions about the bag? Sweet. Do you, need well, to, do you need to sterilize the bag? Yeah, that's my question. Yeah, so um, that's you know an issue that I reach a lot. Uh, you don't need to as long as it's a fresh bag. You just got out of the box and you cut it up in your you know your still air room, your your bathroom, whatever, and then you uh, immediately put it inside the box. It's not going to be that big of a deal. Um, you're just going to want to make sure you use scissors. I didn't bring scissors with me, so I used my knife. <laughs> it's just looking super janky right now. Uh, for the dunking, can you just put a hole in the uh, tote? Like, have it fill up with water, and then once it's finished, then, like, you can have, like, a... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you totally can. Uh, you're just risking pools of water mm -hmm. in your tub, mm -hmm. which is going to make it rot and get contaminated so much quicker, so you're probably not even going to make it past your third generation. Uh, or a third flush generation center for really the thing at this point. So this is almost done. And then after we there's a second a second bag in this equation. Um, I don't have a second bag, so I just have to tell you all. Uh, once we get everything situated with the substrate put in here, um, remember this is the second colonization phase, and when we were colonizing our jars, we made sure they were in dark spaces, uh, because you think about it, I mean, the light's still going to hit this, because it's, the trash bag is only covering, only covering so much. Um, so what I usually do is take another dark trash bag and just wrap the whole thing when I stick it in the closet so that no light hits it at all. Um, but that's important to remember after we do the substrate. So I'll put this down. Okay, so we've got this. Um, this black trash bag is wrapped around not very well on this side, but it'll do the job to represent what it should look like. We we'll move on. We'll cut the air holes. We put the trash bag, installed that inside. Now we're going to do what is called pasteurization. So pasteurization is used to kill bacteria in your substrate. We have sterilization, which is what we did before with our pot and with our pressure cooker. We sterilized our jars and killed off all bacteria by getting it to 15 PSI and letting it sit there for 20 minutes and then letting it cool off. Pasteurization we are letting it get to 175 degrees instead of 240, and we are letting it sit there for an hour and then letting it cool off. So not as hot, but for longer. And what we're doing is we're saving some of the bacteria that is good for the mushrooms. When you get to that specific temperature, um, and you don't even have to, you can literally just pour boiling water um, into the substrate, which, which is what I'm going to show you now. Um, and that's as, as effective as, as it needs to be. Um, there's, no, there's no gauge involved unless you want there to be. You don't have to use your candy thermometer, but you can. So you're going to need a pillowcase to act as a screen and to hold your substrate. So then you're going to need a bucket 
put it in here. So I'll just wrap easier. This is a kitty litter bucket. And so, what we're going to do this, now we're on to substrate. which is what our mushrooms will be feeding off of in the second colonization period. And the ratio um, slash recipe that we are using is going to be one to one cocoa and verm, referencing the cocoa core and vermiculite, which is what I have here. So, I'll open this up. Try to make the least of a mess possible. And I'm going to take my handy dandy measuring cup. And so, this, this depends on the size of your jar. I mean, the size of your mono tub. So, um, like I said, this is this is bigger than I usually do. So I'm just gonna just gonna eyeball it here. Um, and it's pretty easy to do because you, you don't even have to be precise in measuring. All you have to make sure that you do is stick to the ratio. So if I do one big scoop of core. <coughs> immediately do knife um, and then I immediately do one big scoop of uh, here we go vermiculite and I am remaining true to the ratio and to the recipe and it'll all work out <coughs> I'm gonna do I'm gonna do three scoops and I think that'll be enough. Now two more of the cocoa core. So total I am at three scoops of core, three scoops of vermiculite. So what the cocoa core is doing, and if you don't know what cocoa core is, this is ground up coconut husk. It's got nutrients and minerals that the mycelium like, and what it does is it helps um, create those mazes that we were talking about when we were talking about the spawn, how the mycelium likes to weave through those. That's what the coca core is also helping us doing, or to do is to help kind of expand our substrate so that our mycelium can stretch out and weave itself through it to make it a strong, uh, colonized brick. And then the vermiculite, um, it helps it also increase aeration um, and then also helps retain water, which is really important. We're going to need our, our uh, substrate to be hydrated through, through this process. If it dries out, then so does our mycelium and then the whole process just stops and stalls. What is vermiculite? Is it a mineral? Yeah, yeah, it's just a mined mineral. Okay, so I've got a decent amount in there. The bucket's probably filled to like right there. Um, and you know what? I'm actually going to put in one more scoop just, just by looking at that huge tub. I think I think I'll really need one more. And then the nice thing is, is that you could you could just keep adding as you as you need to, you know. So total four scoops each. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add water. And like I said, boiling water. You just <coughs> took this off the stove and pour that in there. And I always start inside bag 
and then you'll want to do this and tie it up. Did you say how much water you added? Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. We're going to hang this. Um, either from the shower curtain in our bathroom so it can drain into the bathtub. I use uh, the pull-up bar in my kitchen and I just put a bucket underneath it. Um, so you just add enough boiling water so that the pillowcase is submerged. And then you want to add, I don't know, something heavy just to weigh it down so that it's beneath the water. So. After it's been weighed down, uh, bucket, pot, whatever you're using, cover it up and let it sit in that boiling water for a whole hour. And then after that hour, uh, you can take off the lid and just let it cool off throughout the night. Uh, I wouldn't take the lid all the way off, I would just kind of move it so that the steam can get out and it can cool down. But same thing as the sterilization. Pasteurization, you want to just leave it overnight um, and let it cool off. And then it won't take the whole night to cool off. It'll take a few hours. Um, sorry for misspeaking, but after a few hours, it's cooled off. Then you want to hang it up, let it hang overnight. And what's going to happen is that as it hangs, it's going to slowly drip and drip and drip. And I'm just going to force it out right now for the sake of time. Now I'm gonna explain something called field capacity. So I'm gonna put this back in here now. Um, so now we have this room temperature pillowcase of equal parts core and vermiculite. It's been pasteurized. So, you know, same precautions we were taking after the sterilization with our jars. We wanna make sure our monotub is ready and that our jars are colonized before we're going to this step because we don't want to waste this fragile, um, effective, clean uh, substrate. Did you mix it it's, or did you just put it separate? Yeah, I mixed it, right. yeah, in the bucket. So it was... It was and, and it stays clean even though you've got this pillowcase hanging in your bathtub? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it, it, acts, it actually, I mean, surprisingly, it acts as an effective screen. Okay. Yeah. And so would you define substrate again? So uh, substrate... Yeah, substrate is um, the substance, the, the energy, the food that we're feeding our mushrooms during the fruiting stage. So it's, it's, um, it's similar to spawn in that we introduce the, um, the spores and then we um, allow the mycelium to colonize, except now, instead of spores to um, spawn to mycelium, we're going mycelium to substrate to more mycelium that will eventually fruit. <clears throat> so, now I'm going to explain what field capacity is. Now, this will drain to perfect field capacity, or pretty close, if you, if you allow it to hang from your bathtub. So, um, I've got this substrate, can everyone see? Mm -hmm. I can move this. So we've got this substrate. Now, this is how we test field capacity. You grab it in your hands, and there should be no water running off as you hold it. Now, if you squeeze, you should get a couple drops. And if you squeeze really hard, you should get a little stream. That's how you test field capacity. If you pick it up, and it's sopping wet in your hands and you're not applying any pressure, it's too wet and you need to hang it back up and allow it to dry more. And then if you pick it up and you squeeze and you're not getting any water out of it, it's too dry. But like I said, if you fully submerge it in the boiling water for an hour and then you let it cool and hang, it will regulate itself to pretty much perfect field capacity, give or take like I mean, very small adjustments that you might have to make. So we have this pasteurized substrate and it's all ready to go. It's room temperature, um, you know, it's, it's pasteurized. We're in our clean bathroom or still air room, wherever that may be. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take our mono tub and we're going to take our colonized jar, uh, and I apologize it isn't colonized, 
um, but just imagine it's very white and it's very fluffy. Now what we're going to do, because it's, it's a brick and it's, um, I have an example of a dried out jar. Um, I guess this one kind of works, but okay, this one, hold on, over here. Uh, oh, it is this one. So, uh, as you can see, this is mycelium that's way dried out, and I mean, like, it's not breaking. It's so strong, and it's dried up, and it's dormant, and it's, it's not going anywhere. Now, healthy mycelium won't look like that. It will look like what is in um, the bottom of this jar, this fluffy white stuff. Um, so if I were to hit this really hard, it would do that. We had a bicycle tire that was just kind of installed uh, in the wall. And so if you tap it, you know, hard against the bicycle tire, it produces enough bump to break up the mycelium effectively. And if you break that up, it'll look like, um, it'll look like it all disappears. So it'll basically turn back into this. And it's like your mycelium disappeared. But all that happened was you broke up all the hyphae and now they've just kind of stuck to the grain. So the next step, after you have all this done, is you hit that, break it up, and now you have this myceliated grain, and you're going to open this up. And you're gonna to wanna to be very quick about this because I'm sure you're all cognizant of the danger I'm in right now as I'm <laughs> fumbling around with this, not wearing a hazmat suit, my scrunchie's coming undone. So, taking my grain, and I'm just drizzling a layer. about three-fourths left. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to take my substrate and I'm going to put an additional layer on top of my grain and I'm going to cover it. And I like to call this um, mushroom substrate lasagna. Yeah. <laughs> After that layer, you're going to pat down the substrate and you're going to go back for your grain and you're going to mix even more grain on top of it. You can do as many layers as you want. You can do as few layers as you want. Some people don't do layers. They just go all in, both of them, and then they just mix them with their hands. I, I, I think I've had more success with layers, so that's what I use. But like I said, you know, um, you're gonna get obsessed with this hobby if you have a successful uh, harvest, and you're gonna experiment, and you're going to uh, customize your own tech, you know? And uh, I hope you share your successful methods with me because <laughs> everyone's learning all the time and figuring out what works for them and then getting bored and wanting to try something new I'm and finding out how to download reduce aeration, right? Um, yeah, but you're also not, not enough to, to negatively affect it. That's, that's why you use the substrate you have, and that's also why you want the mycelium to be in contact with the substrate so it can reach that food. Right, yeah. I mean, if you weren't to, if you weren't to pat it down, you could also you know, be worried about the fact that there's, yeah, like you said, not enough contact with the grain. Um, so I'm running out of substrate he here, um, and that's kind of, I mean, the point you want to get to is that you just use it all up, unless you're about to go over your, your garbage, um, your garbage bag, but I'm not, so. I'm just going more and more and more grain. Um, going back a couple of steps, could you remind me uh, what was the time length for the um, bag sitting in the bucket with the uh, hot water, the boiled water, and what was the time frame for the hanging? So one hour with the lid on top, okay, um, and then uh, you can allow it to cool. You could honestly just go right ahead and hang it and it would cool off and dry at the same time. But one hour with uh, the lid on the bucket is the essential part that you need to adhere to. And then what about the hanging? The what? The hanging of the... the, the um, overnight. Yeah, like I said, it'll, it'll regulate itself so that it has just enough moisture. Okay. And so towards the end, Okay. 
this is what you're going to have. I'm going to walk around with this and everyone can kind of uh, peek into it and we'll come around the side. So you can see grain, you can see the substrate with the core. And ah, this is what we got. Mm -hmm. Oh, yep. <laughs> That's what we had. That's what we had. <laughs> yeah. You get, you get the picture. Come back this way. I have a question for you. You only did one of those jars and you're pretty much out of your mixture. Mm -hmm. So can you hold on to those other jars if they're still in a nice sealed airtight container and just yeah. use one of them? Yeah, totally. How long would they last? <clears throat> um, you, do, you generally don't want to have them in there longer than a month before putting them to use. Okay. Um, they'll either dry out or they'll get too hard to the point where they're like almost impossible to break up. Um, or, you know, I mean like every day that the mycelium is there fully colonized and you don't do something with it, the risks of contamination just build and build and build. So Got it. they'll just start dying off. At that point, should you go out and maybe get a couple more bins to try to, okay. So, yes. is it one jar for a tub, or is it multiple jars for a tub? I usually use one, but as, like I said before, mine's you know almost half the size of this. So two jars for 56 quarts, probably a good idea. And the same thing with the inoculation of the spores. The more you add, the faster it grows, the less you add, the slower. I mean, it's really up to you and, and what you want. Another thing you should be cognizant of is your as you're engaging in this process is your life and your schedule. <laughs> people people well, start growing and then they like have to leave for a week on vacation and it's like about to fruit and they're like, what do I do? You need to plan ahead, you know? So just remember that as you get started, try to factor in your huge vacations or your, you know, yep. never happens. So next step. There's a new job, fruit harvester. <laughs> Just call me up, I'll come and get them. You ready? Uh, <laughs> That's right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I'll clean that out for you. So, yeah. as I said before, <laughs> now <laughs> we're going to take um, our lid and we're going to pop that back on. And now we're going to take our garbage bag and we're going to wrap that over the whole thing and um, yeah and then we're going to put it back in the location where we were originally colonizing our jars and we're just going to let it sit there um, 70 75 degrees is still optimal temperature to keep it at and also about 90 um, yeah 90 uh, humidity levels is, is where you want that to be. 90% humidity, yeah. Inside the box? Make? Yeah, so the, um, you're going to want to get one of these, the Fred Myers. Um, it's a little tiny thermometer um, humidity gauge. And you're just going to wipe it down, isopropyl alcohol or whatever your disinfectant, whatever is, and then pop it into the box so that it's easy for you to check out. If it has a clip on it or you're able to you know, secure it to the side, even better, but you're going to monitor that so that you can. So the temperature outside the box, the chamber is 75 degrees, and the moisture comes from substrate. Yeah. So what happens if the, you're not getting the enough moisture? Or so if you're not getting enough moisture, um, yeah, you're going to just add water. Um, yeah, a spray bottle that has been disinfected, uh, filled with either some of the sterilized water that you've previously sterilized, or distilled water is totally fine. Some people even use tap water. Um, they usually don't have too many issues at this point. Um, I use distilled water every time though. So uh, yeah, if your humidity is getting way low, spray it. If your humidity is getting too high, take the lid off and crack it a little bit like that. It'll increase the airflow, and will, um, like I said, lower the humidity. Yeah. And it's still in the plas dark plastic bag when it's cracked, though, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. What should your humidity be at? Ninety percent. And the thermometer stays in the tub. Yes. Okay. 
you want to monitor the climate of the tub. So 90% and 75 degrees. That's correct. Yeah. And if you maintain those levels, you should be ready in about one to two weeks because it's getting a whole lot more nutrients inside there. Another thing I forgot to touch on with the substrate, and I apologize for this, um, like I said in the beginning, we're doing cocoa core and vermiculite because I want you guys to have a successful first flush. I don't want you to get too distracted with other nutrients that you can add, but if you want to, um, additives, gypsum, worm poop, or castings, coffee grounds, horse slash cow poop. Um, definitely something I'm forgetting. Bat guava? No. Bat. Brown rice flour? No. Uh, no, not brown rice flour either. That's that's for spawning the BRF cakes for PF type, but. Um, so, mainly what most of them do is increase nitrogen <coughs> or add certain minerals and nutrients to the substrate. Like I said, that some people will swear by, you know, they'll, they'll say that if you don't use those, you're doing it all wrong, you have no idea what you're doing, you're a noob. The fact is, is that cocoa core and vermiculite is all you need and you will have successful flushes. Now you might get a little bit more with gypsum, a little bit more with uh, horse poop, but what you're doing is you're also making it more complicated and you're increasing the risk of contamination, which you should avoid for your first run at this. Keep it as simple and as safe as possible, and then once you have the motivation from your first harvest to start experimenting, go for it. So, back uh, on track with this. So, yes. So, is there any need when you start this process to wipe that box down before you start putting all the stuff into it, like the the layering it? Do we need to sterilize the inside of that box or no? Yeah, totally. Okay, so wipe all that down first. Yeah, before you start. I thought I said that. Did I not? Yeah, you did. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just, just wiping down the box. Yeah, before. I mean, any, anything you're about to touch, wipe it all down before you, before you interact with it. You know. Um, and then, as you become more experienced, you'll start, you'll stop wiping down the things that you realize aren't necessary to wipe down. But, like I said before, as you start, everything is, is uh, wipeable. A question about the plastic bag that you put over it. Do you like? Tie it, do you just leave it loose? Like, you want to leave it loose because you do want air to go inside of it. I mean, like I said, like a little bit of air, but uh, yeah, you definitely want it open on one side. And then I usually turn that opening, you know, um, away from the opening of the door so that the closed side of the bag is facing me when I open it up. If you got the blue green stuff, in your jar and you just put it in there anyway, like maybe if you didn't notice it, um, what would happen? So a couple things could happen. Um, so if you didn't hear her, she said that, say you have <laughs> trichodermia in one of your jars, but there's not this many, there's maybe just that little one and you don't notice and you uh, colonize the substrate with it. If the rest of the jar is strong enough, it will take over the contamination and you'll have a great harvest. Or the mycelium's not strong enough, the contamination wins the fight for the substrate and then the whole the whole thing is, is destroyed. Have you ever done uh, any successful surgery? Like, yeah. 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 Um, a few a few different times when I had it's it was like a week in, I've got healthy white hyphae mycelium all over the substrate and then I notice a little tiny speck of green sterilized uh, spoon or scalpel and I mean it's like you're, you're risking a lot but you don't have much to lose at that point either so you might as well try unless it's surrounded by a bunch of other healthy stuff that you have going on you could still try but get it out of your safe zone you know do you do any work with agar as well so uh, agar is uh, another form of colonizing spawn. Basically what it is, 
is, has anyone here ever used a mold detection kit? You know, like it's a little Petri dish and uh, it has this weird gelatinous liquid on it and you uh, can put it in areas and it will detect the bacteria and then grow or you could like touch it and it'll just start bubbling with all this, you know, fuzzy mold. Mm -hmm. So agar is that, um, it's called, it's called agar, the, like the, the liquid, you pour it into the petri dishes and you refrigerate it and it gets solid and then you can cut that, that part of the, so pretend we have this mushroom and we were to um, cut it in half. I mean, it would, it would look like this. Um, there's the gills, and this is like the thing, it's, it's cut in half. There's a, like basically like kind of like the heart of the mushroom right there, it's this really thick tissue. And you can use a scalpel and you can scoop that out and you can stick it on agar and it'll colonize this whole thing so you have this little puck of mushroom tissue. It's more advanced than spores, but it's a better idea because unlike unlike spores, you can't you can't detect contaminations with spores. You can't tell if your spores are like junk. But you could look at the agar dish and see either healthy mycelium or contaminations. And it's extremely easy to do surgery on agar because it's this like solid gel. You just take the contaminations out, and then the healthy stuff remains and you take the little healthy pieces of healthy agar and you toss it into your grain jars and it, it colonizes it very effectively. Um, I don't have any to show here. I have experimented with it. I'm currently not, but totally something to look into um, once you get more familiarized. Thanks for bringing that up, Ethan. So, where are we? We're, we're colonizing this. It's, any more questions about um, keeping this baby warm and, and safe. Okay, so it's been, let's just say two weeks and it's entirely white. Um, it, it looks it looks beautiful, it looks like a fuzzy blanket um, that you could just roll around on. <laughs> so what you're gonna do now is you're going to remove it from your safe space because at this point, it's, it's, it's good to go. If it's all white and you, don't, you can't sense any contaminations, you can be confident in bringing it out into your bedroom or your living room or whatever because you need to expose it to natural light. You need to put it close to a window or even just in the room where light is getting reflected and hitting it. And then you need to pop the lid to increase more air, increase more airflow, decrease the humidity, and expose it to natural light. And then what will happen very quick, quickly, in one to three days, all of your white mycelium will start to produce primordia. And you'll see those little dudes everywhere. Uh, and you'll get so excited. At that point, are you worried about bacteria with the lid open? No. Nope. It's all good then? It's, it's good. Okay. You know, you're, you're, you're confident in it. Your mycelium is so strong. Bacteria could land on it. It'll just like destroy it. So now, now I'll start to explain. So we got we got this big tub, right? There's our trash bag. Now, can everyone see? Yeah. Okay. So we got um, all these little all these little abort babies, right? They're popping up, but then they start to grow up and they become these big dudes. When I was describing this earlier, you want to catch the mushrooms. <laughs> Before that veil breaks, because that is when they are one, the most potent, and two, if they open up, they are going to start dropping spores all over your other mushrooms and your other little babies and they are going to start to get all wilty and messed up hmm. and discolored and they're not gonna look as beautiful. They're gonna be all brown and gray and gross or purple. That actually looks kind of cool. Um, but, you know, the thing is, is that it's not gonna be in sync. It's not like they're all going to be like this and you're gonna be like, perfect. You're gonna harvest all of them at the same time. You're gonna have some that have already opened and then you're gonna have a ton 
that are at the base that are the little babies that are going and they're gonna have time that are just like getting ready. And it's gonna be this huge variety of, of different mushrooms that are growing at different rates. But when you get the first few that start to open, that's generally a good time to start because you also have to know that when the cap opens and the spores start to fly away, they're losing potency. Another important thing to remember is that these little aborts are full of psilocybin. Don't ignore them because they're so tiny. Um, they, a handful of those little tiny mushrooms uh, is equivalent to, to you know one of these guys. So don't dismiss them. So you're saying harvest everything Harvest everything. You don't just harvest the big stuff and then mm -hmm. let the other stuff yeah. get bigger. Because a lot of them won't get bigger, and that's why they're also <laughs> called aborts, you know? Hmm. It's pretty obvious. They, they just stop and they quit. So um, another important reason that we make sure we harvest everything is because when we take our cake out and we dunk it either in another tub or in a bathtub or we just pour water into it and then dump the water out, if you have a bunch of aborts, you have all this mushroom matter, and then you soak it in water, and then you take it out, it's gonna get contaminated like that. And then you're screwed. The whole thing is just gonna turn super gross and smelly. Um, and so you wanna make sure that you're harvesting as much as you possibly can. Technique for harvesting mushrooms at this point, pinch the base, apply pressure, and just wiggle a little bit, and the whole thing will just pop out. And if it doesn't, Cut as close as you can, and then go in after and try to do some surgery to get as much of the matter out as you can. Okay, it, but, so how do you check it without getting light on it to make sure that it's myceliated? You can either use a red flashlight, or if you're shining your phone light at this, at this tub for five seconds, it's not gonna trigger it. Okay. So, or it's, it's, not confirmed, but it's pretty well known that blue light is what triggers the fruiting. So if you could, you know, just get a flashlight that doesn't emit blue light, then you're fine. Uh, on the contrary, uh, if you don't want to expose your tub of mushrooms, say you have children or something, you know, you can get advanced grow lights that emit blue light you know go to a hydroponic store and just tell them you need a blue light and they'll hook you up with something and you could fruit you know in your closet or in your basement or wherever it is that you're going uh, there was a question yeah um i've heard that if you spray peroxide on the substrate and the mycelium before mm -hmm. you put it in the bag it prevents um like um, yeah so you... it it makes sense in theory but You've never used it. I've used it and to try to save things before, and it's never worked. It's always just, okay. it's always just like yeah, soaked it and made it gross. Yeah, I've, I've, it's, I've heard hit and miss from my mm -hmm. research. So I've heard um, of people foraging in, in the wild, uh, finding psilocybin mushrooms. But I mean, if you've ever gone mushroom hunting before. It's like, you could find a ton of mushrooms, but <laughs> a big majority of them are pretty gross, you know, and, and just, yeah, kind of gunky. Um, and I've heard of people pouring hydrogen peroxide on them and then kind of washing it away and then eating them. Off topic, but any other questions? One, one last question. How often would you check that? Because you're saying like once a day before when it was the spawn, mm -hmm. so substrate, how often would you? I would check it every day at this point. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So. What I'm seeing there are three different um, categories, the aborts and then the ones with that have uh, the veil has um, split open and yep. is dropping spores. Yep, so this and is the one open. And, yeah, and the ones before that, what are they called? Um, I'm just closed caps. Just closed caps. And just remember, those are, those are <laughs> optimal. Optimal thicken, yeah. Okay. So what do you wait for one to pop open and then just harvest everything? So, yeah, and, and another thing is that what you should probably do is as they begin to open, because there will be those few that come out and they're just like, I'm ready, and they pop open, but then everyone else is like, I'm not ready yet, slow down. Um, just pick those, uh, pick those guys out and then make your spore prints and then dry them and they'll just be dried They'll be dried outside of it. 
but generally you don't want to do that for too long you know as you start to pick if you pick a few of them you'll want to pick all of them within the next day Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, and once you've picked them, do you just dry them, air dry them? Yeah, so I generally use a sushi rolling mat. It's just a uh, like bamboo sushi rolling mat. Uh, it provides good airflow from underneath. You could also toss them in a dehydrator. Pretty good idea. It's easy. Um, you could also use uh, silicant packets you know, like what, what they use to keep food dry. This uh, book also has a really good thing on drying them too, so I don't know if you wanted to see that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and it just, yeah, it describes the sushi mat. Yep. When, when you're drying, doesn't the heating element uh, denature some of the psilocybin? The way? The heating element in the dehydrator. If you have one that's a fan and a heater, you want to just use the fan? I think it's going to be above like 175 or something like that. Yeah. I've never, I've never even personally used a dehydrator, so I'm not sure about that. I use a dehydrator at like one over five, and I've never lost potency. I yeah. think like the faster you get it drier, the the more you can keep the potency. Yeah, and then once they're dry, they're locked in, and you could, you could put them in a bag, toss them in a freezer, and they'll be, they'll be fine for for a long time. Um, and how long does it take them to dry? A day, day or two. It shouldn't. It shouldn't take long at all. You could literally, I mean, just leave them out in your kitchen, and they'll naturally dry like like everything else. Okay. Um, so yeah, storing them, you know, in the freezer is fine. In mason jars, closed is fine. <coughs> there is something I would like to to point out, um, and it's like I said before, one of the biggest differences between this technique and the PF technique is that the PF tech you are going to get maybe an ounce your whole journey. This one, you're looking at more of a quarter pound, which is hopefully not your personal dose. <laughs> so, if it is, <laughs> but I'm cautious and, and weary of, you know, equipping people with the knowledge to create quarter pounds of mushrooms I think it's kind of awesome, <laughs> but um, yeah, I just wanted to say, you have all these mushrooms on hand, give them away, give them away for free. There's tons of people that weren't able to make it to the mushroom workshop, and I know it, it would be awesome if you sold them, but being a drug dealer is, is not cool, um, and it's, it's a very small step between being a friend, a discreet friend that gives mushrooms away um, and to being a drug dealer and from there on it's a slippery slope and I, I highly recommend that you don't go down that slope um, and that you just you just help people out you know pass on the pass on the good deeds and you'll be happy enough with with your harvest I assure you you show you that much and you probably won't need that much convincing once you eat some of your own mushrooms and you'll be like oh he's so right <laughs> um, so yeah, on that on that note, it's we got 13 minutes left, and so that's that's all I got. I do want to, uh, if someone could hold up, I saw the psilocybin yes. guide going around. If I could, if I could get that. There you go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This book, great resource, the psilocybin mushroom bible. They um, they lay out the techniques and almost all the techniques pretty well. Well, they focus on mainly the PF tech and what we just talked about, but things like agar, things like drying techniques, um, they, they do a really good job of explaining. Um, they do lack in details. So I read the book, made a lot of mistakes. It took me watching someone lay it all out before it really clicked for me. Um, and then also, this is one I just happened to bring. This is Paul Stamets, Psilocybin Mushrooms of the World. I did want to mention a few things about foresting in the wild because um, it is the easiest way to get mushrooms. I mean, we live in Portland or the Portland area. They grow everywhere. Um, so a, little, a few tips. If you pick the mushroom and it bruises blue, it contains psilocybin. Never ever eat the mushroom 
unless you send it to someone and they've confirmed that that's the mushroom that you think it is. Even if you pick it and it looks awesome and it bruises blue, don't assume that it's psychedelic. There's tons of mushrooms that are not good for you that bruise blue. I'd also like to kind of help clear the stigma. There's not that many poisonous mushrooms out there. Um, but, I mean, there's not that many deadly poisonous mushrooms. <laughs> there's tons of mushrooms that will just, you know, make you poop your brains out and make you sweat a ton. Um, but still, it's not fun. You know, there's, there's lots of risks involved. And, you know, people have allergies they're not aware of. So, yeah. And then just another um, reminder of, of the different types of mushrooms, parasitic, saprophytic, and mycorrhizal start paying attention to um, mushrooms. Uh, for instance, cyanessens, one of the most popular mushrooms in Portland. They grow all over our city parks everywhere. And they are frequently found in alder wood chips, which are um, you know, kind of like a dark red wood chip. And so if you're walking in your university or at your work or by the courthouse or in Washington Park, and you see those red wood chips, keep your eyes peeled because they're there. That's all. That's all I got, well, folks. I yeah. Did I hear you say during the break uh, one of the attendees has put together a PDF? Of all this no. Stuff? So someone recommended that. Um, yeah. I so one of the attendees put together a PDF of the PF Tech method. Huh. Um, and if anyone would like, if anyone is confident in their notes taken tonight and wants to send them to me so that I convert it into a PDF, um, I'd really appreciate that. That'd be what, sweet. What's your email? Um, uh, so if you want to stop the recording, goodbye YouTube, thank you.